So let me talk just a little bit about these three building blocks of competitiveness and innovation, because you'll be discussing these over the day, and of course they're at the heart of what you're going to do here in Alberta. The first, of course, is talent. People are the source of new ideas, creativity, high value innovation requires the best and brightest to converge around complex issues. But it also requires skilled people at the entire continuum of human activity. People are the oil of the 21st century. I completely believe that one of the most competitive differentiators among nations is going to be something called differential rates of learning. Just think about that, differential rates of learning. How fast and how deep people learn and how they apply that learning will be huge differential for our competitiveness. A cross-disciplinary team is absolutely essential to drive high-value, game-changing innovation. It has to span the arts, the humanities, social sciences, business, design, marketing, managing, and science and engineering. And no single discipline or entity can do all this alone. You have to create the cauldron of creativity. And there's a little saying I like that says, we need artists who think like engineers and engineers who think like artists. That is at the heart of differential learning and game-changing innovation. The second pillar of innovation is the ecosystem is infrastructure. Again, we've already talked a little bit about it. But one of the most crucial elements, and the one you're working on, and we're working on, and every country's working on, is what is the business climate and the enabling conditions that enable this high-value economic activity? Clearly, tax policy, fiscal policies, the mobility of capital, R&D, all of those things enable the infrastructure for innovation and competitiveness, as do, of course, things such as trade policies and standards and market access and a nation's openness to foreign investment to new businesses and market development. And infrastructure has to be thought of today so much more broadly than the physical infrastructure of roads, bridges, and transportation to the digital infrastructure the high-speed broadband, access to high-performance computing. You're a leader here in Alberta in how you set up the infrastructure for the knowledge economy, and I hope that that is something that you build on going forward. The government's role in setting a nation's legal and regulatory framework is of huge importance. And this is something that in the United States we have a lot of challenges right now because we're trying to make, excuse me, the best balance between regulation to incentivize the dynamic role of the private sector in wealth creation, but at the same time ensure the safety, the health, the efficacy, the transparency of all our systems. And of course we learned from the uh, disaster that started with our subprime mortgage and banking system that not having transparent regulatory systems in this space really led to the spiral effect that moved into the global economy. At the same time, we have regulatory impediments that are a huge burden for us. For instance, our product liability laws. I don't know how many of you know this, but over 2% of the GDP of the United States is spent in tort payout. We spend 2.6% of our GDP in R&D. Not only is this a huge amount of resources that are going away from productive activity, it's created a chilling effect on next generation technological development on where companies come and do their work and where they build their infrastructure. It's something that's at the heart of the agenda of the Council on Competitiveness. Productivity churn, job churn, creative destruction, all of that is part of the competitiveness journey. And we have a lot of job churn and destructive churn in the United States. We think this is a good thing. Every year, about 10% of our establishments are new and 10% go out of business. That is part of the innovation path that I hope you all look at here in Alberta to encourage the churn of creative destruction as you build on your assets but also look about the future that you're going to create out of what you have here in terms of your talent, your investment, and your infrastructure. The third major pillar of an innovation ecosystem, of course, is investment. The patient capital for investment in research, technology development, business formation, transformation, entrepreneurship. 
And I have to say, just having come back from Egypt, I love the Alberta Competitiveness Pyramid. I think it mirrors the ecosystem very, very beautifully with the foundation of tax and fiscal policies, the regulation, access to capital, all of those things as the enablers for innovation. So with that little overview about the building blocks of the competitiveness framework and ecosystem, I want to spend a little time talking about the global transformations. Because over the last two decades, we have been watching the world, engaging in the world, understanding what's happening. But right now, we are in a time of tremendous turbulence, transition, and transformation, unprecedented in human history. And I'm going to share with you what some of these transformational shifts are and what they mean to the United States, to Canada, and to the world at large. The first, of course, is the digital revolution and global network communications, who have, which has brought an unprecedented integration of the world's national economies. Information, capital, know-how, technology, talent, all flows across borders as never before. Game changers have really altered the world, one of which you've created here in Canada, Rim in Motion, and all the Blackberry addicts who cannot function without these devices. The second shift is the meteoric rise of emerging economies who just 20 years ago competed on natural resources, low-skill commodity goods. They were slowly working their way up the development curve. The curve has been shattered. They are now integrated into global value chains at the favored location of foreign direct investment. In one generation, emerging economy shares of global imports, exports, and FDI have nearly doubled. And it's the emerging economies, particularly the BRICS, that are leading the global recovery. And you couple that with the tremendous shifts in demographics, in population, and urbanization, and you have a shift of unprecedented magnitude in human activity coming out of the emerging economies. The third shift is the demise of the multinational corporation, which no longer exists. We have the emergence of the integrated global enterprise. It's seamless, it's digitally enabled. It is an enterprise of companies, foreign affiliates, suppliers, contractors, workers, production networks and service networks that span the globe talent networks, and now global innovation teams. So there's a global dispersion of research and innovation that requires all modern economies to connect with these global innovation ecosystems. The global business enterprise has changed the nature of trade. It's no longer about goods moving physically across borders. It's about how the global enterprise develops through consumer demand-driven interests, products and services that serve these growing markets through foreign business ventures, foreign affiliates, and tapping into the best and brightest. Let's not forget that by 2020, 80% of all middle-class consumers will live outside the developed world. Now, this has created a fundamental new dimension to national competitiveness. Why? It's created a fault line and tremendous social tensions in the United States, and I expect to some extent here in Alberta and Canada. U.S. competitiveness used to be synonymous with the competitiveness of U.S. firms. We competed together. So we looked at things like trade and global market share. How much American firms had of these things? This was one of our metrics for U.S. national competitiveness. But today, so many of these firms are global enterprises. The sales from foreign affiliates of U.S. companies are more than three times greater than the value of all U.S. exports and services. This is a piece of data we produced in our last competitive index. It's profound. All the sales outside the United States by U.S. global enterprises are three times the value of all of our exports. Now, the sad thing is we still have tax policies, which we're going to try to change, that punish these enterprises for repatriating any of these profits back into the United States. That's a very good example of how a tax policy works totally against a national interest. So where are they investing? They're investing these profits all over the world. They're not bringing them back to the United States. 